Is this working? Yeah, okay. I didn't know if the mic was on or not. I am using the headphones that are broken, so I cannot tell. Let's see here. How about now? Yeah, that's better. Um. Hello. Actually, yeah, okay. No, this is working. Uh, apologies for that to all. Good evening. I am, as always, Ben Walter, and this is WCCR Student Radio. Um, I, I don't have a little a little quippy uh, intro segment this, a little quip uh, intro segment this week. I am kind of, I've been up to my neck in homework and schoolwork, and so I, this is kind of a, a last minute show and I haven't really done too much prep for it. Um, and also, the story from this week is much, it's older and it's from, you know, it's a little bit uh, less a little bit less, um, there's less info, like, about the time period on, on Wikipedia, which is my source, um, and so, and, and it's, you know, it, it's just a little bit more difficult to, to do something with that, but, anyways, I am Ben Walter, this is Cosmic Abyss, and you're listening to WCCR Student Radio. Today... I am going to be reading The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. And this story is published in 1842, a little bit earlier than anything else that we've read thus far. And I chose this story just because it uh, is about a group of aristocrats who and, and royalty who all seal themselves in uh, their extravagant mansion to have a party while a deadly plague is, is killing the common folks. And so what they do is they just go and seal themselves in where they think they're safe. And uh, yeah, I just think it kind of it does, I, I've seen uh, mentions of this on Twitter, and so I figured it would be good to give it a read, considering everything going on right now. I'm getting a call. One second. Does this mic work? Hi. Shut the, shut the fuck up, Ben you're on, Walter. You're on grab bag. <laughs> Who's speaking? We had our first guest. <laughs> uh, big shout out, shout out to Mark for for that little lovely call in. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. All right. I'm just I'm I'm kind of all over the place today. Anyways, we'll get started here in just a moment. So sit tight. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, 
or the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in, this wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion and while well, the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. These were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here, the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bizarre. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect, to the right and left. In the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber to which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. Now. In no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum. Amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof, there was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. 
but in the western or black chamber the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all it was and his apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull heavy monotonous clang and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken. There came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound Thus the waltzers perform ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows, each to the other, that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then there was the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But, in spite of these things, there was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar, he had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conception glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fit, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and fanatism. Much of what has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There were much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock, which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then, for a moment, all is still, and all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant. And a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again, the music swells, and the dreams live, and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, 
There are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light for the blood-colored panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls. And to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal, more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears, who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an e uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now, there were twelve strokes, as to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who revelled. And thus too it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure had arrested the attention of no single individual before, and the rumor of the new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz, or murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such, I have, such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seem now deeply to feel that, in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask, which concealed the visage, was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse, that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all this might have been endured, if not approved by the mad revelers around but the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares? he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. 
At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who, at the moment, was also near at hand. And now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if one with impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers. When none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all, he bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleamingly upon the sable carpet upon which, instantly afterward, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. So that's uh, that's the story. That's 
It's a short one. A short one this week. Um, I needed a, uh, a little bit of a short one after last week and the previous week. I know I had a very, very long one. It took, it was like three and a half hours of, of reading total. Um, yes, that is The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. And I am reading this one uh, because of, as many are aware, um, lots of our politicians and elected officials are coming down with, with COVID-19 after a, uh, they had a, a little, a jaunty little revel at the White House where all of the uh, American nobility and the, the aristocrats all met up and decided to cough and sneeze on each other and, and everyone get everyone sick. Um, so that's why this story has been kind of trending a little bit these last few days, and I figured, eh, yeah, might as well. You know, it's as good of a time as any to to read it. Um, I'd actually never read it before, before today. I mean, that wasn't my first time reading it just now. I read it um, earlier. But, yeah doing prep for the show is the first time that I ever read that story. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge Poe fan. Um, I don't love his style. I really don't love, like, writing style, like, like, gothic writing style. It's not, it's not my favorite. Um, it can be hard to understand, and it's, like, a little, a little wordy, and it's just not really... I don't know, it's not super interesting to me. Um, so that's why, I, you know, I'm not like a big, I'm not a big Poe guy, I'm not a huge eight Jane Austen, that's not gothic, but that's like, you know, eight, 19th century lit. I'm not, I'm not big into um, stuff from the 1800s, I guess. And is that a stupid take? Yeah, probably. Um, like, I mean, I'll read it, obviously, but I, I, if I had to choose a century of, of literature, it would be the 20th century, and it would be the probably second half. Um, yeah, it's just, that's just my opinions on things. Actually, no, probably the first half of the 20th century, because that's like Hemingway. Maybe, maybe, I'd say like the middle half, like 1925 to 1975. Yeah, if I need to pick half half a century to read, to only read books from, because that has, that's like Hemingway, that's Lovecraft, it's Vonnegut, it's, you know, it's everyone, everyone who I, who I really enjoy reading. Um... But, uh, yeah, that is, uh, so I, I was, you know, doing some, I looked into this story a little bit, like, symbolism and stuff, and it's more or less allegorical for, uh, aging and, and, like, living and, and dying, you know, which is, I guess, you know, I, I, that's a very gothic theme, um, but so each of the rooms represents, like, a different stage of life. So the blue room, which is all the way on the east, um, which it, so it, like, represents, like, sunrise and, like, purity and, like, a new, like, a new life, you know, like, being born. Like, that's when you're an infant. It's blue. And it's, like, you know, also, like, the idea of, like, baby blue. Um, and then it, I don't remember the exact layout of the, uh, of this, like, party, um, but as you continue west, you know, that's as the sun kind of sets, which are the different stages of life, you know, like the, you know, teenage years or adolescence, like adulthood, middle age, uh, like being old, being really old, and then dying. Those are the stages of life. And the black room 
obviously represents death. Um, that's where the the red death was. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm exhausted right now. I'm like falling asleep in the radio station. Um, so so forgive me if I'm kind of incoherent. I will very likely cut this show short today. Um, well, definitely I'm not going to just ramble for the next hour and a half. I may even cut it before nine. Um, I mean, which is fine. Um, I was I was thinking about reading another story, but I just I I can't. I'm just, I'm just too tired. Um, but yeah, so so the the Red Death is you know it's just the concept of death and it kind of is you know it, it's exemplified by you know it's a plague and then it's kind of the plague embodied like the physical like a like a manifestation of the plague apparates at this party and it goes and kills the first guy, kills the prince, and then he, then the, the other party goers go and they, you know, take the mask off and the robe, they see that, oh my god, there's nothing underneath, and then they all die of the plague. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like, the only thing I, was, I, so, Right, I went into the story expecting, like, I kind of knew what it was about because, again, I'd seen stuff on, on, on the internet about this. But I was kind of expecting sort of a, like, a little bit more of, of a, like, criticism of, like, wealth, you know? Like, how the, like, criticizing the, uh, these rich people for locking themselves in their apartment um, while all the, like, common people are dying. That's what I kind of expected it to be about because, like, that that's is what I was seeing it uh, related to in real life. But you know, there wasn't really too much of that in it, which you know is fair. I don't know if Poe was like an aristocrat, you know, like if he came from a rich family or anything. I genuinely don't know very much about Poe other than the fact that he is from Baltimore. So, yeah, I'm no, I, I, I don't really have any insight into that. Um, but if he was, that would explain kind of the, like, you know, lack of criticism against them, you know? It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, look at these people having a party. Good for them. And not any criticism or anything. Um, but, uh, yeah thinking yeah I, I think I'm gonna call it I'm, I'm just I'm exhausted I'm so I'm so sorry to anyone who is listening or planning on listening um, I will not be here next week um, I will be camping next weekend and so it's going to be a week without me on the radio. So consider yourself lucky that I will not be bombarding you with uh, desperate pleas to listen to my radio show. Um, but the following week I will be back. I will be significantly less tired in the studio, probably, hopefully. And it will be a little bit a little more lively um, and I am planning on being here mm, I'm not planning on I'm not planning on not being here any other weekend um, so you can expect me after a brief hiatus next week um, you, know, you can expect to be kind of stuck with me for a little while um, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter at Grab Bag Radio. Drop a follow on there. Find out more about the show and 
uh, when I'm going live and any, any updates or anything. That's where I post everything first. Um, also follow WCCR on Purdue, or on the, oh my god, I'm so tired. On Instagram and Twitter, at WCCR Purdue is their handle. Um, really cool organization, really fun to be part of it. Really love it. Um, I think it's a really cool opportunity to be able to, to do this. I think it's a lot of fun. So big shout out to them. Um, there you are. Yep, so... You know, anything you want to say to me, tweet, DM, at Grab Bag Radio. Have a good night. Have a good week. Have a good two weeks. Uh, it's October, which means it's 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 haunted. It's, ha- it's, freaking, it's freaking spooky season, guys. It's, oh, my goodness. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll have some good ones for... Uh, for the weeks that I'm back. I feel like I would be remiss to not fully capitalize on my opportunity as a like horror-esque radio show to, to use the month of October to its fullest. Um, oh yeah. Anyway, have a good evening. Peace out. <laughs>